This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Episode 199. Welcome, everybody. Next week, episode 200, the interview that seems to be garnering lots of anticipation just based on the, the comments I've been seeing. But next week is Professor Eugene Fama. Incredible. Uh, two weeks after that will be Auntie Ilmanen, author of the book Investing Amid Low Expected Returns. And in five weeks' time, it will be Professor Ralph Koijan from University of Chicago. So it's pretty good lineup. Pretty technical, good content. Super fun time to be doing this podcast. Yeah. Also, my head's my head's going to explode. R- Ralph in five weeks. That's uh that that's intimidating. His he's 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 done a lot of he's done a lot of writing. It's interesting how the the podcast has kind of ebbed and flowed. You know, we kind of went into more psychology and time management stuff. So it's been kind of now in the more technical phase and. It, it's it's been incredible, actually, incredible people we've had a chance to meet. Yep, and that was only somewhat intentional, right? The shift into psych psychology type topics that was that was pretty intentional, but the shift back to to deep yeah. into Chicago has been less intentional. It's just kind of happened. Yeah, it's kind of happened, which is great. Yeah. So you want to touch on the community? Yeah. Uh, so we we talked about. I should have noted which episode it was, but we talked about. Uh, goals, how to set financial goals and all that kind of stuff uh, a while ago. And one of the things that we talked about wanting to do was creating a, a goals master list. Um, basically, people are really bad at setting goals. Uh, one of the steps in setting the most meaningful goals possible is referencing a master list of goals. It's like, what are all the possible goals that you could have related to this thing? So in this case, related to finances. That master list doesn't exist. So one of the things we wanted to do after that episode was send out a goals survey where we would collect goals from a whole bunch of people and collate them into a master list. So we are going to do that now. When the episode releases on Thursday, that goals survey will be available in the community. So you can go in, there'll be a post Great. in there. It's a Microsoft form. Uh, it's anonymous. It's submitted anonymously. So you go in, there, there are three questions about financial goals and we'll collect the responses. I have no idea how many we're going to get. We've already done the survey internally at PWL. Uh, I, I think we maybe have 50 responses so far, but the hope is to get kind of hundreds or maybe even a thousand or so if, if we can. And then we're going to take some time to, to parse that down into a, uh, into a nice list of, I don't know how many goals will be on the list. No, no clue how it's going to turn out. Such a great idea. I think it's brilliant. I think it'd be, I think it'd be cool. I think it'd be really cool because there's nothing out there. there there's one version of this that, that exists that Morningstar did. Uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It's, I, I, I don't find it to be inspiring when I look at it personally. So I'm hoping that we can come up with something that's pretty cool. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, 22 in 22 reading challenge is still going. Of course, we have 478 participants that have read, get this 1,411 books so far. Uh, we've had a number of people make it to the halfway mark. So they've read 11 books. And when you do that, you get a, a token that gives you a coupon to get 50% off any item in the merchandise store. And there's been a bunch of orders come through that have reached that milestone and have decided to take advantage of that, which That's is cool. pretty cool. Uh, we're going to continue doing the special every month, a special guest to join us. So in June, we have Katie Milkman, who authored the book, How to Change. She'll be joining us to talk about her reading habits. And then in July, we have Dan Solon, author of Ask and a good friend of ours and also a past guest is going to come by. Um, today's episode, we welcome a longtime friend of both Ben and I, as well as a longtime client, Aiden Merze. He joined us for a great conversation about reading. Uh, Aiden's well known in Ottawa, but likely beyond Ottawa, as he's been a pretty successful serial entrepreneur. He co-founded Fluidware, which was sold to SurveyMonkey, and he's currently CEO of Fellow, which is a software that helps make meetings more productive. We use Fellow in our business, and it's a great uh, tool to help with meetings. 
He's also host of the podcast that we've mentioned many times, Super Managers. And I'm a huge fan of that podcast. I listen to every episode. And many of the guests that Aiden has on the podcast come from his reading habit. And you remember, remember Ben, we talked about the book, Working Backwards. You know, that was from Aiden's reading and his podcast. And uh, we share, Aiden and I share book titles back and forth fairly often. Mm-hmm. The, co- the conversation, uh, from conversation the st- with Aiden was really good. I, 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 I've known Aiden for, for years. Um, I was... I, I came away feeling impressed, honestly, by he just had a lot of really yep. insightful stuff to say. It was and just a bit of energy. Yeah, he's, good, he's always got good energy, <laughs> but it, it, really good insights. So that, that was, uh, I, I really enjoyed that part of the conversation. From the store, I don't know if you're wearing the green shirt. I got the new green rash reminder shirt on for those on YouTube. So they're available in the store. Um, also got a little incentive. We have some of the winter toques available. So we thought any order, just put a note. If you order something, just put a note in the, in the form as you check out, just say, send me a toque and Jackie will send you a toque for any order you've got. So this also gives us a way to see if people respond to us mentioning something on the, on the podcast. Hmm. You want to talk about some of these reviews, Ben? Uh, Sure. We, we, they're, they're, Since the well, first one's about you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the first one just says, Ben Flix, F-L-I-X dash financial and a picture of a goat. <laughs> <laughs> From YouTube to podcast. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, very nice one. One from Canada. They, they love the contents, the hosts and the guests on the show. Uh, they want to learn about investing, economics, and behavioral finance, and this show covers all those topics. So they want us to keep up, keep up the great work that they think we're doing, which is, of course, appreciated. And sleeping easy from the states. Incredible information, succinctly delivered. Just found the show by searching the web for financial analyst journal article that he couldn't locate. And now he's hooked. Love the thoroughness and thoughtfulness of the content. I'll give you him or her. I don't know. Can't get enough of Ben's research summaries. Best way to earn PL credits around. Also enjoys my book recommendations and can't wait for Fama, double exclamation mark. You know, we're, we're getting close to uh, a thousand, not, I mean, not so, somewhat close. It's 777 reviews on, on iTunes at this point. And I remember when we started the podcast thinking, man, imagine having a thousand reviews on iTunes. That'd be nuts. And now it's getting kind of close. So did you know, also notice the total download count is approaching 3 million? Oh, I did not. Wow. Another interesting thing, which I tripped over last week, the number one downloaded audio episode is the John Cochran episode, around 26,000 downloads. But when you add in the YouTube, it's over 40,000. So it's a, the ratio of YouTube downloads is really picking hmm. up steam. On LinkedIn, I continue to hear from lots of people on LinkedIn. I love it. Adam an advisor in Manitoba I connected with last week. Uh, Another person, Allard, who's considering a career change just past the CFP course. We're chatting this week. Uh, Chris B. in Toronto connected. And just to let me know that he left a review. And I also wanted to thank um, Jorge Diaz, who wrote the book, Car Leeson Done Right. Phenomenal book. We've talked about it. He gave a terrific training session to our advisor group a few weeks ago. First rate. Just a phenomenal presentation. So, uh, Jorge, thank you for that very much. So as always, connect with us on LinkedIn, on Instagram at Rational Reminder. On Peloton, I'm CP313. We also have the club hashtag Rational Reminder over there. Both of us are on Twitter. Is is, is, is Peloton still, is that still a thing? People still do that? Apparently. I still do it. A lot of people I know still doing it. Every time I go on, there's someone in the community that's done the ride. So you you can see, like I don't ride with other people, but you can see other people in the club have done that ride. So you can see how your time compares. Hmm. But in aggregate, I have no idea. Very interesting. No idea. Very interesting. Yeah. All right. Shall we go to the episode? Let's go ahead. Welcome to episode 199 of the Rational Rider Podcast. All right. I have a great book review for you. And uh, as we heard Aiden at the back end of this episode talk about, explain why. So I'll explain why I like this book a lot at the end. So the book is called Setting the Table, The Transforming Power of Hospitality in Business 
by Danny Meyer. So Danny Meyer is the founder of Union Square Hospitality Group and is obviously one of America's most successful restaurateurs. He founded the, the company in 1985 and they own many of the top restaurants in New York City. So iconic restaurants like Gramercy Tavern, Union Square Cafe, The Modern, Blue Smoke, Shake Shack, and many others. I think there's well over two dozen restaurants that they own. So Danny's an incredible business leader and he's famous, particularly famous for his views on hospitality, which leads into so many other areas like hiring leadership, corporate responsibility, the list goes on. If you're interested in learning more about him without reading the book, he had a great interview with Shane Parrish on The Knowledge Project and also with our friend Matt Hall's uh, podcast called Take the Long View. He was also a guest on Freakonomics, I think a year or so ago, talking about their transition to a no tipping policy, which is also called a living wage policy. So as I said, I've been aware of Danny Meyer for ages, but I'd not read the book until earlier this year and it's been out since 2006. And it's so interesting to me because if you think about restaurants, so many restaurants fail in the first few years. So to have had the success that Danny has had with so many restaurants and different brands, and they're all unique other than Shake Shack, unique one-off experiences, I think that's a testament to the fact that he's figured something out. So the book, of course, starts with his upbringing in St. Louis, his family, his parents, travel, and through that, he, his description of food is unbelievable. But then he ends up in New York City and sets up his own restaurant. Anyways, let me get to the main takeaway. The main takeaway of the book for me is, and I think this is important for anyone who's in any sort of a service business, like we're in a service business, Ben, if you own a restaurant, any sort of business where you're dealing with the public, I think it's important to understand the whole concept of hospitality, versus service, and he goes to great lengths to break down how they are different. Service is the technical delivery. Hospitality is how that service makes the client or the guest feel. Service is standard. Service is technical proficiency. Hospitality is dialogue, follow-up, care, concern. You know, one example he gave in the book, which I think illustrates it so well, is you know when you go to a fancy restaurant, I don't know how many times you go out for a fancy meal. I don't do it that often. But you know, you get that little amuse bouche, I think it's called, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the meal. Some places will come on and give you some great big long description of this amuse bouche and what it is and how they made it and all the ingredients and all the effort they put into it. His argument is likely the guests don't really care. They just want to enjoy the amuse bouche and enjoy their time together. So he says, don't focus on what you need to get out of that experience of telling them about the amuse bouche. Let them just enjoy it. So he articulates that hospitality is the sum of the thoughtful, caring things that we do to make clients feel that we are on their side when they do dine with us, or in our case, when they do their investment planning with us. And he talks about right down to how the table is cleared. He describes it like a ballet or how a bottle of wine is open. And I don't know if you've seen that before, but sometimes you go to restaurants and you can just tell that they've, everything they've practiced and, and have it down in art form, like how they open the bottle of wine and how they pour it. It's just so perfect in so many restaurants. So he describes service as a monologue, hospitality as a dialogue. He says, you have to be aware of what your guests value. So here's some other things he points out. Hospitality will cause patrons to take on a sense of ownership. Shared ownership develops when clients talk about your company as if it's theirs. You know, this is my restaurant. Great hospitality means you know your guests and you collect information. How many restaurants do you go to now? Do they actually collect information about you? And you think about it, it's amazing. Like Lisa and I have a restaurant here in town that we love. And we think, oh my gosh, they have such an opportunity to learn what we like. What, when do we like to go out? What sort of menus do we like? What sort of specials might we like? What sort of, you know, like we love their, 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 their crab, for example. Well, maybe they have crab in, they could let us know by email or text or something. They don't do that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is something that Myers restaurants do. Hmm. And they make this happen at scale. So they know that if you go to a different one of their restaurants, they know enough about you to make that experience better. That's cool. But to do that at scale, think about that. Like how busy these restaurants must be, hmm. right? Um, when you hire, look for excellence. We've all heard this, of course. Um, 
His favorite reviews are the ones that say the food is fantastic, but I really love how great your people are. And he's possibly best known for what he calls his 51 score. So he says anyone you hire, if you look at a score out of 100, at most 49 of those 100 points can be allocated to their technical expertise. Innate emotional skills will always count for at least 51% of the score. So he says you got to score on the 51. And he gave this illustration of a light bulb. He says, you take a light bulb, the technical side of the bulb is all the engineering, the electronics, the glass, how it's made. But he said the emotional side is the brightness, the warmth, the ability to see and all the non-technical side of the light bulb. So the top five core emotional skills that he looks for are optimistic warmth, so genuine kindness, thoughtfulness, intelligence, and the curiosity to learn for the sake of learning, to have the excellence reflex and a work ethic, so a natural tendency to do something as well as it can possibly be done. Empathy and awareness of and care for and connection to how others feel. Self-awareness and integrity. So an understanding of what makes you tick and a natural inclination to be accountable for doing the right thing with honesty and superb judgment. For example, in his restaurants, you're not given a script of how to say things. You have to create your own script. He gives you guidelines though. Like they can't come up to you and say like, how are the first few bites tasting, which I think we all hear in every single restaurant you go to now. So you're encouraged to come up with your own way of seeing how everyone is. He also talks about how you must know your center. And he says, he's learned over the years that everyone that you come across will try to move you off your center. And it could be your employees, it could be your guests, but you've got to keep bringing it back to the center. He gives this analogy of a, of a salt shaker. The salt shaker is supposed to be in the middle of the table. He said, everyone's kind of, coming at you to try to move that salt shaker. So he says, you need to know your values. So he's talking about your values. You have to know where your values are. So you have to know your values and live by them and believe in them constantly. And he said, everything in the restaurant is like that salt shaker. So he says, the definition of business is problems. His philosophy comes down to a simple fact that business lies not in the elimination of problems, but in the art of creative, profitable problem solving. Food is secondary to uplifting outcomes for human experiences and human relationships. And here's his probably most famous line, business like life is all about how you make people feel. It's that simple and it's that hard. How you feel in a restaurant is so much more than the food. So key points, hospitality exists when you believe the other person is on your side. Shared ownership develops when guests talk about a restaurant as if it's theirs. This is true of any service business. Dots are information. The more information you collect, the more frequently you can make meaningful connections and make other people feel good and give you an edge in your business. The information is sitting right there. All you have to do is pick it up. And the excellence reflex is a natural reaction to fix something that isn't right or to improve something that could be better. So this excellence reflex, he talks about how it's rooted instinctively in people's upbringing and, and you can, you can improve it. You can hone it. You can bring it to your job every single day. So highly recommend this book. If you are in the service business, again, uh, many people I know in our industry have this book on their bookshelves and use it regularly. Great book. In the, in the experience business, maybe, right? That's what uh, True. Dennis Mosey Williams, Williams ta told us about a yep. long time ago. Yep. yep, I'm not big on restaurants, personally. But if you were to go to a restaurant, you would prefer an experience. You know what? As you were talking, I was thinking about that. I don't know if that's true. When I go to fancy restaurants, which I, I very rarely do, but when I do, like you said, you can tell that it's a performance that they've practiced. And I actually find it personally anxiety inducing because I can, I can tell that they're performing and it's not the fact that they're performing that makes me nervous. It's hoping they don't screw up. Not for myself. Interesting. I know that I would feel terrible if they messed up because it's obvious how hard they're trying. That, that's personally my experience eating at fancy restaurants. That's one of the reasons I, <laughs> one of the reasons I don't like it. it stresses me out. <laughs> all right I, w I wanted to touch real quickly on on arc uh i try I, I didn't have daily data i tried to recreate these numbers 
uh, just because I like to double check numbers before I talk about them. I, I, I didn't have daily data though. Um, th- th- this this data looks like it came from a Bloomberg terminal screenshot or I don't know. I don't know what the data source is. But anyway, it's from Christopher Bloomstrand who has been a vocal critic of ARC and Chamath and just the all, all of the Oof. large growth tech stuff. Um, and he, but he's got very intelligent commentary. So it's interesting re- to read his stuff. Anyway, so he tweeted... Uh, on April 28th that on that date since inception of the ARK ARKK the the main the main fund uh, as of as of uh, April 28th it had underperformed Berkshire Hathaway since ARK's inception just it's interesting it's like the you know uh, leading up to the dot com bust Warren Buffett was criticized for not being in tech and then tech crashed and yep. <laughs> he came out looking pretty smart. And uh, I'm not saying that's what we're seeing again here, but it is uh, it is a pretty amusing anecdote. Just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Certainly no shortage of people piling an arc right now. Piling on with criticism, but not assets. <laughs> Actually, I think they had some positive asset flow this year. Do they? Piling yeah. on though? I'm not sure it's piling on. That's why I qualify that. I just think I saw <laughs> something like that going by, but I think they're down 20 plus percent in April alone. Yeah. Well, it's been a rough go and you, you got to yeah. feel kind of bad for the people who did invest at the, at the peak. I think the unfortunate this is a this is a guess, a hypothesis. The the unfortunate thing is probably that a lot of the people who did pile in late were relatively uneducated, naive investors. I doubt it was large institutions, for example, investing at the peak of ARC. That's a guess though. Yeah. Uh so I wanted to follow up on bonds. We talked about bonds in our last episode before Gerard and I don't know. I, I just had more to say. I, I also found it interesting that after our last episode where we did talk about bonds, a lot of the a lot of the tone of the discussion in the community afterwards and and before actually is bonds are a divisive topic, which is weird. <laughs> why why would bonds be a divisive topic? I don't I don't know the answer to the question, but some people really like detest bonds. <laughs> And then other people are like, well, you know, I, I want to have less volatility or, or I want to have more certainty about future consumption. So that's why I own them. And then uh, other people are like almost angry. Why would you want to own bonds? It's, it's just a, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, observation. But I was thinking about that. And I think, I think asset allocation decisions, I, I think the way people often think about asset allocation decisions is from a uh, cap M mean variance perspective. Now, what do I mean by that? It, that's the the single portfolio, the, the theory that there is one mean variance optimal portfolio and everybody's going to combine that with the risk-free asset to find their optimal portfolio and it completely ignores investor heterogeneity, right? So I think a lot of people think about asset allocation from that cap and mean variance perspective, which means that if somebody holds a portfolio that is different from yours, they must be wrong or you must be wrong, which makes asset allocation topics very emotional, <laughs> This is just an interesting thing that I was thinking about. Uh, but of course, as we've been talking about the the ICAPM uh, or, or just investor hetero, heterogeneity in general, there are infinite optimal portfolios for each individual investor depending on their yep. outside income, their other assets, their their preferences, their tastes. As as Fama talks about in our episode next week, I asked Fama what, what dictates the difference in people's portfolios or whatever. And his answer was tastes. Like it's all tastes. I was kind of taken aback. Like, what about other stuff? Uh, but he was, t- taste was his answer. Anyway, so there there is no single optimal portfolio, which means that somebody can own bonds and some other person cannot own bonds, and they can both have the optimal portfolio for for themselves. Uh, asset allocation is not something that we need to fight about, unless we're talking about dividends, which we're going to talk about a uh, a little bit more later. That was a that was a joke. People can own dividends, dividend paying stocks. 
uh, if you think about the average investor theorem, the, the the global market cap of stocks at the end of 2021 was about 105 trillion U.S. dollars. For bonds, it was about 150 trillion. So if if we take the average investor, the theoretical average investor, that's a 40 percent roughly stock, 60 percent bond portfolio. Wow. Now, of course, the average investor is not an individual. Like there's a lot of those assets are institutional and a lot of those bonds in particular, I, I would guess are, are institutional. So you probably increase that equity. I don't know, maybe it's, maybe the average retail investor is 60, 40 or, or 50, 50 or something like that in that, in that range. But in any case, it's not a 100% equity investor. <laughs> um, I, I, I also just, when I was looking at those numbers, I thought, what is how, what does real estate make up in that mix of of total uh, total assets? Uh, the estimate I found for the total real estate market cap was three hundred trillion. That's like all real estate, residential and, and everything, not just investable real estate. Three hundred trillion. Wow. So fifty four percent of the of the market uh, of the total market portfolio. If we as classify the market or define the market as as real estate stocks and bonds so it's all residential and commercial as, as everything that's that's global uh, the the estimates for investable real estate are much lower i think if i remember correctly i saw an estimate at 10 trillion that's like professionally managed real estate that yeah. you could invest in through a REIT or through a private real estate fund or something like that but 300 trillion is all real estate assets which wow. you like not investable right just like most private businesses aren't investable. That's the interesting thing about that number, right? Is we're talking about the 150, uh, 105 trillion for stocks. But if we included all unlisted businesses, that number would be much larger. That's anyway, true. Um, so based on 300 trillion, that's 54% of, uh, in the average investor theorem, 54% of their portfolio is real estate. And interestingly, I went back to Petermier's paper, which talks about, theoretically optimal real estate alloc allocations, but also looks at some empirical data on real estate allocations. It's kind of in that range. So it's kind of a kind of interesting to to see. Anyway, that's the only thing I have on real estate. I just I just I was curious when I was looking at the total stock bond numbers. Uh so back to bonds. When when prices fall, as we talked about last time, expected returns rise. It's very mechanical in bonds. When, when when stock prices fall, expected returns also rise, but it's not nearly as mechanical. With bonds, it is extremely mechanical. And when we found, when we did our expected returns paper a while ago, the predictive power of current yields was like, it explained like 90% of the uh, differences in future returns, whereas for stocks, it's it's 20%. So current yields matter a lot for bonds. And when prices fall, current yields go, uh, go up. Uh, something that we didn't touch on in our last episode about bonds is that nobody's recommending a 100% fixed income portfolio. And that's something that I think I, I, I regret not talking about in our last episode. I talked about here's what stocks look like in the data. Here's what bonds look like in the data. But we didn't talk about them together. And that's what really matters because, you know, assets in isolation don't matter. It's what do they contribute to a portfolio. So that's one of the other things that I wanted to touch on in this uh, revisitation of, of bonds. Now, before before talking about that, Bonds after bond bear markets. I, I looked at the data on this, which is pretty interesting. So if you go back to 1900 using Canadian long-term government bonds, which is what the Dimson Marsh Staunton data use, there are 13 calendar years, because this is annual data, uh, 13 calendar years with a real bond return of negative 10% or worse. Two of those were in 2021 and 2013. And I'm going to leave those out of the rest of this discussion because there's not enough future data to make uh, to make any interesting observations. Uh, so uh, another interesting point actually is that all of these drops are before 1981, which may, maybe you'd expect because since 1981, rates have been going down, down, down. Bond mm -hmm. prices have been going up, up, up. So you don't have as, as much uh, negative return experience uh, but leading up to 1980, we did have rising rates. And that's what people are worried about now when you look at, uh, when, when people look at, oh, rates are going to go up, therefore, bond returns are going to be terrible. Well, I mean, there's some truth to that if if rates go back up to 1981 levels, but of course, we can't know that. Uh, so on average, 
in these 11 calendar years with a 10% or worse bond return, long-term government bond return in Canada. Um, on average, the return was negative 14% for those, for those 11 calendar years. The worst was in 1915, where long-term government bonds lost 26% in the calendar year. It's pretty, pretty bad. Keeping it like long-term government bonds are volatile assets though. Like we know this. So this isn't, people shouldn't think about uh, this and think, oh, my universe bond index fund is going to do the same thing. It's a, it's a different animal. There's not a whole lot of long-term government bonds in uh, universe bond index fund. Not, not enough where your returns would resemble anything like this, at least over the same periods. Now the decade following those returns, and this is the part that I was really interested in when I started pulling these numbers. So if we look at the decade following the returns, including the year with the negative 10% or worse return. Mm -hmm. So starting with that negative year and then including it in the, in the decade, the following decade, the average decade returns were positive 1.73%. So that, that was pretty interesting. Huh? That's a real return, right? Real. Yeah. Real annualized return. That is gotcha. correct. Uh, the worst decade, and this is, we're going to talk more about this decade in a second. The worst decade was 1947. Um, so the first year in 1947, there's a negative 10% return, real return. But then the average annual return, the, the annualized return compound for the following decade was negative 2.8%, real, but annualized. That's, that's, that hurts. Um, the, the best decade, this was also interesting. The best decade in my sample of negative starting points was in 1920, where there was a negative 14% real return to start. And then it went on to have a positive 7.3% annualized real return for the decade. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I also had that wow thought when I saw that data point. Um, now, we have this 1.73% figure. Uh, so the, the other thing that I wanted to, well, I, I kind of knew the number, but the, the other interesting observation there is that the real geometric average return for the full period, 1900 to 2021, is a little over 2%. So in the decades following negative 10% or worse uh, returns, you're, you're actually pretty close to the long-term average. So you start with the, the, the worst negative years as starting points. The following decade is, what is that, 27 basis points lower than the very long-term average, including post-1981 where returns have been crazy, crazy high. So I, I just thought that was kind of, uh, kind of interesting. It's like a, a bad year is not a death sentence for bonds. It actually doesn't look a whole lot different from, from normal times. Um, now, the, the, the time for long-term bonds to recover their real value after the negative 10% return, this is also an interesting data point, was on average 12.5 years, which is a long time. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not minimizing that it is a long time, but it's heavily skewed by periods starting in 1947 and 1948. Uh, they took, you ready for this? 42 and 38 years, respectively, to recover wow. their real value. So if you owned long-term government bonds, Canadian government bonds in 1947, you took that initial hit, um, but you didn't recover your purchasing power until 42 years later. So I thought that was pretty crazy, pretty crazy to see. And I, I, I kind of knew that data point, but I don't know, digging through, going through and seeing the numbers was, I mean, that's, that's wild. And of course, but again, it, these are long bonds to confirm long-term bonds, long-term Canadian government bonds is what we're looking at here. Um, now, of course, over those 42 years, this is still a volatile asset. So you're, you're getting, uh, no compensation for taking on a whole lot of risk, which is, uh, not, not that fun. Now, again, to be, to be clear, we have been talking about long-term Canadian government bonds. So we just talked about that, that really rough period, uh, 42 years of, of flat real return starting in 1947, um, go, going until 1981. So before breaking even 
uh, you had taken some pretty serious losses in Canadian long-term government bonds. So from 1947 to 81, you lost a cumulative 53% in real terms. That's it's a big loss over a long period of time. In annualized terms, it's not that bad, but it, it chipped away at a lot of wealth over a long period of of, uh, of time. U.S. government bonds were very similar. In cumulative terms, it was like a 50 basis point cumulative difference over that full period, so kind of, kind of immaterial, very similar performance. What's interesting, uh, and, and I, was, I was very interested to, to see this result and, and uh, curious, but before I looked at it, because uh, I really didn't know what it was going to look like, corporate bonds did better. Uh, depending on the data you look at, quite a bit better. So uh, 1947 to 81, 53% cumulative loss in long-term government bonds. Triple, this is U.S. data now, triple A corporate bonds over that same period lost a cumulative 45% uh, in one data series I, that I looked at, the Ibbotson series in, in Morningstar. And then asked what the Motoran has uh, a return series as well for triple A, so like high-grade corporate, long-term corporate bonds. Uh, they lost, a, in his series, lost a cumulative 34%. Um, so between the two data series, say it's a, a, a 40% cumulative loss over the period for taking a little bit more credit risk, long-term corporates. And then Demodoran also has BAA bonds. So this is uh, lower credit, but still investment grade bonds. Again, long-term corporates, but again, more credit risk. And they lost uh, a cumulative 18%. So again, a material improvement. So we've gone from long-term governments taking a big cumulative loss, long-term high-grade corporates taking a uh, still meaningful, but not, not as bad as uh, long-term government loss. And then again, taking on a little bit more credit risk with the BAA bonds. Uh, again, still a, still a long-term cumulative loss, but uh, not, not quite as bad. So what do we learn? Well, uh, diversification is important. <laughs> We kind of know that, uh, but within bonds, diversification matters uh, matters a lot uh, based on this sample. And of course, anybody investing in a universe uh, a universe bond index fund has uh, corporates, uh, government bonds, uh, and different maturities. These are all long term bond series we've looked at that we've looked at so far. And well, that's all we're going to look at because that's what most of the really long term uh, data tends to be. And, and then the other thing that's important, of course, is how how do bonds perform alongside stocks? So over the over these bad periods, I looked at a 60-40 portfolio just of Canadian Canadian stocks and Canadian long-term government bonds. I didn't add the corporates in here uh, just to keep keep this piece of the analysis simple. Uh, so in those bad periods for long-term government bonds, uh, the decades starting with the negative 10% or or more long-term bond returns. They, the 60-40 portfolio had on average a 6% real return uh, per year over those decades. Um, so pre pretty, pretty good, relatively speaking. And that's actually a better return than the full sample average for the 60-40 portfolio. And then in the 1947 period, where bonds had meaningfully negative returns for decades and were flat for m more than 40 years on average, uh, a 60-40 portfolio returned 3.2% real from 1947 to 81. Uh, and that's the period when bond returns were meaningfully negative. And then by 1989, when the long-term government bond portfolio had broken even uh, to where to, to the purchasing power that it had before things declined in 1947, the 60-40 portfolio over that period, uh, so 47 to 89, 1947 to 1989, 60-40 portfolio returned 4.4%. So again, diversification at work, uh, both within bonds and across stocks and bonds. Would you have been better off in a 100% stock portfolio? Well, in terms of your total return, yes, uh, but it would have been more, more volatile. And the last point I want to make, you would have had a wider distribution of outcomes or potential for a wider distribution of outcomes. So... Braden, I, I asked Braden to look at this. He had a model built for that, that we used a while ago uh, to compare different equity markets. And I just said, hey, can you feed this this data for bonds and uh, and a 60-40 portfolio into the same 
into the same code. And uh, it spat out some some really interesting numbers. So we looked at rolling historical periods. We use bootstrap, uh, sorry, rolling historical, yeah. Rolling historical, bootstrap, and Monte Carlo. So rolling historical is taking 40 years is the, the numbers I'm going to talk about. So it takes the 40 years starting in 1900 and tells us what the return looked like. And then it steps one year forward to 1901, tells us what that 40 year period looked like. And it keeps stepping forward one year until mm-hmm. we've used up all the data. That's the rolling historical periods. And then we did bootstrap. So bootstrap is uh, randomly sampling from the actual re- historical return distribution with replacement. So we've got this big bucket of annual historical returns. We pull one out, stick it in our simulated distribution, put it back in, pull the next one out. It goes in our simulated distribution. And then we also did Monte Carlo, uh, where we take the historical uh, mean and standard deviation, and we use that to randomly generate our own distribution of returns. In this case, probably because we're using annual returns, the Monte Carlo and Bootstrap are basically identical. Um, A lot of the non-normal characteristics of stock returns seem to kind of go away or get a lot weaker when you do annual as opposed to monthly returns. So anyway, I'm going to talk about the bootstrap, but just so everyone knows if they're interested, the bootstrap and the Monte Carlo were, were very, uh, they were very similar. The cool thing about bootstrap is that with rolling periods, we're constrained. Like there, there are, uh, three, non-overlapping 40-year historical periods from 1900 to 2020, which is not a lot of data. The The, the overlapping data is uh, still, there's still information there, but it's the non-overlapping samples that are, that are really insightful, but we only have three. Um, with Bootstrap, we have, well, we ran 10,000 simulations. So you just have way more data. Now, it's simulated. So there are pros and cons to that, of course. Uh, Anyway, so, oh, yeah, I wanted to talk about serial correlation. So when we run the bootstrap, (laughs) serial correlation dies. That means any relationship that uh, year-to-year returns might have, like uh, mean reversion or momentum or anything like that, goes away. So we killed that with bootstrap. That's one of the downsides. Maybe it's a downside, maybe it isn't. But it's a difference between bootstrap and and uh, historical uh, historical analysis. So using rolling historical periods at the fiftieth percentile, uh, stocks returned five point six two percent over forty years. For bootstrap, that drops to four point six three percent. So I just hmm. wanted to mention that to highlight the importance of serial correlation in the historical returns. Mean reversion makes returns less volatile, uh, which, which increases the 50th percentile, uh, return in this case. So we're, we're, because we don't have serial correlation, we might expect lower returns in our simulated results than we've had on average, but you don't necessarily want to bet on historical mean reversion repeating anyway. So that's why I say there's kind of, uh, there's kind of pros and cons. Uh, okay. So in, in the bootstrap, the 90th percentile return is uh, 8%. 10th percent, uh, 10th percentile is 0.95% for the global stock portfolio. So it's a big distribution of outcomes between the 90th and the 10th percentile. In terms of ending wealth, uh, that's a difference between $100,000 turning into 2.2 million at the 90th percentile or turning into 150,000 at the 10th percentile. That's a wow. big distribution of outcomes. Wow. It's not as big if we look at historical data, but I don't know if that's the right thing to do because we've got three basic, basically three periods and we know ex post, they've all been pretty good, uh, all things considered. In the 60-40 portfolio, using the bootstrap, at the 90th percentile, the return was 6.1% and at the 10th percentile, it was 1.12%. So a much tighter range of outcomes in that case. And the 10th percentile was better than 100% stocks. Marginally better, but it was still better. Uh, so then we looked at the conditional value at risk, uh, CVAR, which the way we defined it is, is the average outcome in the fifth percentile of outcomes. So the average outcome in the fifth percentile, um, the, the worst outcomes on average, I guess. For stocks, 
minus 130 basis points. So we're deep in the left tail here. On average, at the fifth percentile of stocks, minus 130 basis points, whereas for the 60-40 portfolio, plus 46 basis points. Not, not a great return in either case, but difference between losing a lot and not making a lot. And that's kind of that left tail risk for stocks that can sh could, could show up. Who knows if it will, though? That's the, I, I guess that's the risk. Uh, so again, keeping in mind that those, those results are from, uh, from bootstrap, the historical data, I, I think the historical data looks, it looks, it looks calming almost because, because of how good it looks, because returns do revert to the mean and they've been positive. Uh, there's actually a, a paper that was floating around the rational minder community today, looking at much longer historical returns going back to the 1700s. And that, that was something maybe we'll talk about in a future episode, but the, if you go back really far, uh, this most recent period, like the starting in kind of 1940s to now, where, or even the 1900 to now, where stocks have uh, pretty much always outperformed bonds over long periods of time, you go back further in history and there have been periods where stocks underperformed over long periods of time, 100% of the time uh, relative to bonds. And the data changes wow. as well. Like how I mentioned corporate bonds earlier, when you compare stocks to long-term government bonds, they look really, really good, relatively speaking. But when you add in corporate bonds, uh, stocks have a, a higher hurdle to overcome. Anyway, so that's something that we can touch on in, uh, in a future episode. But I think we're, we're often lulled into a sense of safety by how good stocks look in the, in the readily available historical data. Absolutely. But that's not, that's obviously no guarantee of the future. And I think people get that, but I don't know. I, I, I think the risk of stocks in the long run often gets uh, minimized. And we, we talked about that, I think, quite a bit in the last episode on this. Um, in, in the years where, so just speaking to bonds as a diversifying asset, in, in the years, all of the years from 1900 to, to now, where stocks had negative returns, on average, bonds had positive 1.5% returns. So that's that the, the benefit of diversification. In the first half of the sample though, where rates were rising as opposed to, to falling like they have been recently, uh, when stocks had negative returns, bonds had on average negative 1.86% real, real one-year returns. But stocks in, in that same period in the years where they were negative, were on average negative 13.35%. So still a big reduction in drawdown from holding bonds, even over that period where the, the correlation was positive as opposed to negative like it's been more recently. Uh, I, I also just wanted to touch on, in, in the Credit Suisse, Credit Suisse Global Returns Yearbook, the 2022 edition, which came out recently, they had a pretty good discussion on, on bonds. So they show that well bonds have had larger and longer real drawdowns than stocks. A portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% bonds has had fewer extreme negative events than either, either asset class individually. So kind of what we were just saying there about the benefits of diversification. It's kind of neat to think about, you know, the, it, 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 it just kind of makes sense. Because of the characteristics of each asset, you would expect them to respond differently to different economic circumstances. So the diversification benefits I don't think that they should be too, uh, too surprising. Uh, so Dimson, Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton talk about how stocks and bonds have individually, on several occasions throughout history, lost more than 70% in real terms. Uh, since 1900, a 50-50 blend of stocks and bonds has, in the U.S., never, and in the U.K., almost never, had a decline of 50% uh, or, or more. And the duration of drawdowns is briefer uh, for the blend than it is for bonds on their own. And, and then I, I alluded to this earlier, but they also make the interesting point that e even though uh, bonds are less economically less risky, um, the, the because the baseline expected return for bonds is lower than it is for stocks, uh, it's it shouldn't necessarily be surprising that we do see in the data extended periods of negative real returns 
because you're starting from a lower point, even with less volatility, it's not out of the ordinary to have long periods of negative or, or flat real returns. Um, I, I mentioned correlations a second ago. One of the reasons that stocks and bonds have historically looked really good in portfolios, especially in, in more recent history, uh, more recent history is that they've had lower negative correlations. Uh, on average, the five-year rolling average correlation of stocks and bonds in the U.S. is negative 0 0.27 and, and in, in the U.K. is negative 0 0.09 back to 1900. Um, like I mentioned, they've been negative recently, but if you go back in time, there have been periods where they're pretty positive, long-term government bonds and and uh, and domestic stocks. Like in the U.K., there was a point where the correlation, the five-year rolling correlation was 0 0.8 which is like, that's, that's very high. And then mm -hmm. in, the, in the US, it was about 0 0.7 for a period of time. <laughs> so, I mean, that's one of the things that I've seen uh, people talking about, like the, the leveraged ETFs of uh, long-term treasuries and, and stocks. Let's, let's combine those together in a portfolio. And because they're negatively correlated, it's the perfect portfolio. You've got triple leverage. And, and if they crash, they're going to crash at different times. So you're, you know, it's, it's basically free money. <laughs> but the problem is this, it's like, yes, in, in recent history where everybody has data to play with, correlations were negative, but you push it back another 50 years or more and there are lots of periods where correlations were, were positive and a strategy like that blows up real Incredible. hard. Uh, okay, so my takeaways from kind of poking away at these long-term bond numbers uh, is that after calendar years of poor performance, bonds tend to go on to produce historically normal returns on average. Not necessarily high, but in line with uh, the historical average. There are some outliers, some big, uh, really one big outlier, uh, which is long-term government bonds in that period starting in 1947, where they went on to have a long period of poor returns that accumulated in a very substantial long-term loss at the worst point. And yep. it, it is actually pretty time period specific too. If you dial that back uh, a little earlier than 1981, it, it doesn't look quite as quite as bad. But anyway, either way, it didn't look great. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, to my my su surprise and and perhaps my delight over oh, <laughs> over matched time periods <laughs> when those uh, really really bad returns for long term government bonds happen, corporate bonds have done much better. And bonds in a portfolio of stocks have done, I mean, quite quite well. Uh, and you take all that together and then think about the the distribution of outcomes that we talked about. Uh, again, I, I, I think it's it's very reasonable to own bonds just just for that purpose, just to reduce the uncertainty about future consumption. And as an asset class, I don't think uh, I don't think there's anything. I, I answered an email this morning for uh an article that that uh it's it's for the uh the etf all-stars article that money sense does and the one of the questions from the person writing it was how much drag should we expect from aggregate bonds going forward on the assumption that rates are going to rise and my my response was basically that well if we could predict that rates were going to rise say to 1981 levels yeah, hey, maybe maybe I would recommend not to own bonds, but I, I would recommend all kinds of stuff if I could predict <laughs> rates going up to exactly. 1981 levels. Um, but we don't know that, and I, I think at a point in time, at, at this point in time, the expected returns of bonds are just fine. So there's there's nothing nothing wrong with owning bonds, particularly as part of a broader portfolio designed to meet a certain objective. Awesome. Awesome insights. Okay. So we will do the irre relevance of dividend irrelevance next time. Yes. I, I mentioned, I mentioned that we were going to talk more about dividends and we are, we are out of time today, but, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll cover the relevance of dividend irrelevance. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm quite excited about that topic. I think it's going to be a good discussion. I think it is. So, how about we go over and have a conversation with Aiden Rose for the 22 and 22 reading challenge? Let's do it. 
Aiden, it's great to have you join us for the, uh, the reading challenge discussion. Yeah, excited to be here. You know that I'm a big fan of you guys, so. Well, well we're a big fan of you. And, and as we mentioned, your podcast, the super managers on this podcast many times, so it's great to have you with us. Yeah, ex excited to chat about also a topic that I'm always excited about. So, Well, you're such a lifelong learner and you and I have exchanged emails many times just talking about different books. So it's great to have you join us to talk about your actual reading habits. So to kick it off, how do you describe your reading habit? Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like I'm a very strange person. So I, you know, I don't know that <laughs> I recommend other people do what I do, but um, it, it's interesting. Like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a creature of habit. So I think like when I first started, uh, you know, consuming content, it's very largely audio based was, you know, back when we used to have a commute to the office. Right. And so I learned that, uh, rather than, uh, you know, just listen to music and it was hard for me to make the transition because like music is very, like, it's awesome, right? It makes you, puts you in a good mood and so on and so forth. But one thing I learned about myself, and I think this is true for most people, is that like, even if you don't like doing something in the beginning, if you do it for long enough, then you will start liking it. And so I thought if I can only like keep listening to an audiobook instead of music, um, if I do it for long enough, my hypothesis is that I'm going to start enjoying it. And so I, I started doing that and it was painful in the beginning, but then I got really addicted to it so much so that like, Every time I got into a, a you know a car, or every time I went you know for a walk, or you know as I'm in between things, it just became like the thing. So if I could fill up my in between time with consuming content, that could be super valuable. Um, and it's so interesting, like just going back to the creature of habit thing. Uh, you know when the pandemic happened, and you know fellow, uh, we went uh, you know we're a remote first company now, and so my co commute disappeared, and I was very addicted to my audiobook time. So so you know, this is why I don't recommend others do it, but basically I've decided to generate a commute for myself. So every morning I, I drive to Starbucks uh, and I'm listening to my audiobooks on the way there, on the way back. And then even when I go on my run in the mornings, uh, I'm also like listening to an audiobook, uh, you know, the whole way. And so I, I'm getting probably, you know, I would say an hour to two hours of just content consumption time like during this period while I'm doing other things. So I don't feel like I'm ever just sitting down and only reading. I'm always doing multiple things at the same time. And uh, for productivity junkie like myself, that like really gets my juices flowing anytime I'm like, ha, I, I beat the system and I got more out of my time than I otherwise would have. And, and so that's the stuff that excites me. Do you consume all your reading in the audio format? Uh, I would say I consume probably 90% of it. Yeah. In, in, in that way. I mean, there's a lot of advantages to doing things like this. I, I, I built some hacks around it. So the, the way that I, you know, think about this is like audiobooks. Uh, I mean, books serve many purposes to me and we can kind of get into all the different purposes. Um, but one of the things I find is that, especially with business books, uh, one of the biggest things I get out of business books is, it helps me generate ideas. So a lot of times you'll have a book and, and I'm sure you've read books like this where it's like the title tells you the whole point of the whole book. And you're like, why did I read that whole book? But, but the thing is that inevitably a lot of those sorts of books have a lot of different stories and examples and so on and so forth. And a lot of times what I find is like when I'm consuming something like that in the process of listening to it, I will think about things related to my own business or what's going on in my own life. And so what I've learned is what, what I do, and oftentimes it's like, oh, I should talk to our marketing person and get them to you know, look into this. Or maybe what if we reorg our company like this? And so it gives me all these different ideas. And what I've learned is that if I don't do something about the idea right away, then basically it's as if I didn't have it. So what I do now is like I have an Apple Watch. And so every time I'm on a run or I'm anywhere, I'm constantly leaving voice notes for myself. And then what happens is like when I get back home at a desk, I action all of the ideas and the different thoughts and everything else that I got from, you know, the material that I consumed. So it looks really weird if you ever see me out there running, but I'm like listening to this thing and then like, like speaking out loud as I'm, as I'm basically, 
you know, taking down notes. Uh, but it, but yeah, I've even taken the note taking process and I've turned it into like an audio, uh, an audio note taking format. So yeah, I would say Cameron, like the ninety percent of my, and, and I consume a lot too. Like it's not like volume wise, it is a lot of stuff. Um, I do sometimes buy, you know, the Kindle version of certain books if I want to reference them. The reason I like the Kindle version is because on your computer, you can also get the Kindle app, which allows me to like control F and like go to that section and like copy and like paste it somewhere else. So I know that like, as long as I know that something I can reference, you know, at a future date, like having some, sometimes I will buy like the, the digital version for, for that or the Kindle version for that reason. Hmm. Yeah, that's funny. Your, your reading habit sounds very similar to mine. I'm, I'm big on audio too. And, but I, I don't do voice notes. I have, uh, 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 notes on my phone. So I'll stop and start typing on my phone. I probably look weird too, but in a, in a different way, maybe not as weird as talking. But to my, it's, to ben, it's hard to do that if you're driving. So voice notes yeah, are that's, that's incredibly true. helpful. Like it's such an unlock though. Like, uh, the like ability it. to do voice notes, it, it's just like, it, 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 it's amazing. I usually read while I'm walking, so it's not an issue, but the, the voice notes are definitely more versatile. It's a great idea. You mentioned business books. Do you have a favorite, a favorite genre of book? Uh, yeah. So here's, a, I mean, this is an important thing for me too, because I, I always like talking about the why. And, and so for me, the, the thing I think about books is books are leverage. Uh, it's very interesting, right? Like you can basically say like, imagine if I had the smartest person in a particular topic to teach me about a certain thing. Like people are all excited about the concept of a masterclass, but like, Books basically are masterclasses. Like this is extreme leverage. You can go choose any person in the world that you want to learn something from if they've written about that topic and you can learn that. And, and, and here's the best part. They spend a lifetime learning about something and then they spend years writing and then you can consume it in 10 hours. Like if that's not leverage, I don't know what that is. Uh, so that that's why in general, I'm like very bullish on, on the concept. But in terms of genre, like, it really, what I, what I figured out is like my favorite genre that like I always get super excited about is biographies. I particularly like them if the person, the author is over 70 years of age, uh, because that, my, my feeling is that after that point, people stop like it's not about, you know, showing off or like hiding certain facts or they'll just tell you like it is and it, it feels more real. Um, and I also like it if it's an autobiography, that's definitely my favorite. But what I would say is like each book has a different use for me. And so what I found is that like, I get different things uh, from different books. Uh, biographies are really, really good for me because they serve as, you know, I learn a lot of things from them, but they're also very motivational in nature. So a lot of times you like, I'll find where like, I mean, you know, businesses, as you know, you guys know, like building a company is a lot of works. It's got ups and downs and sometimes it's more challenging and sometimes it's a roller coaster ride and it's uncertain and it's not. And so what I find is that like, uh, it's a really good motivational boost for me to like listen to uh, the, the trials that other people have had and how they've kind of overcome them. And so, yes, I learn, but it's also an emotional, uh, like it, it also helps my psychology as well. So I reserve those things, um, you know, for, for that purpose. And sometimes I won't waste them because I'll know that like, I really want to go through this, but I should really save this for like, you know, a certain emotional like time. Uh, the other things I think about are like, you know, different times I want to go deep on different things. Like I'm very excited about learning about something. And so like, I've been get very excited about, you know, for example, operations in general, uh, and Cameron and I have been exchanging notes on this, but you know, things like working backwards, the book, uh, oh. or amp it up or, you know, the high growth handbook, which I'm reading right now, these are like very operationally focused books. And what I found is that like, if you can figure out what's going on in your life and what you really want to kind of amplify, reading something that is related to that will get you to get way more out of the book than you would at another time, because you're just going to be that much more interested. If I force myself to read something where like, I'm not like, it's not super relevant to me right now. The interest at which I'm reading that thing is way, way lower. And so I will get a lot less out of it. Um, which is why like, 
a lot of times it's not just about what is the book, but it's also about what is the book for the period of like Absolutely. what would benefit you the most. So it's almost like, you know, we talk about product market fit. It's like book, you know, time period in your life fit. And so uh, some books I'm like very like high growth handbook, which I'm consuming right now. Like you don't understand. It's like, how do I generate like more in between time? So I can just like, really hardcore, like, listen to this. I'm listening to it at 2x speed. I'm just trying to, I'm like, I can't, like, maybe I should take a day off and just like, oh, <laughs> listen, because it's so relevant to what, what I'm going on, like what's going on at Fellow right now. And, and it, it just, it, it increases my interest. So where did you get the idea to read that book from? Like who sourced that for you? Um, so this particular one, I got at a, uh, at, at a CEO peer group. Uh, so it was, yeah, it's basically CEO peer group and you know how peer groups grow. You basically are like, Hey, here's some challenges and, and people tell you about experiences. And, you know, someone said like, Hey, have you, uh, read this? And, and I said, no. And, uh, and then, you know, a few other people seconded it. And so I, I started listening to it and yeah. And then it, it, it's awesome. I haven't finished it. I rarely recommend something before I finish it, but in this particular case, it is, uh, it is that good. Well, that, that was my next question because you referred a number of books to me. Can you share how and why you commonly recommend certain books? Yeah. By the way, like this is a thing that I think about advice in general. Advice is really dangerous. Um, and, you know, time is super valuable. So it's, it's always, you know, everybody has a book recommendation, right? And so I think it's not the book recommendations that matter. I think the important question to ask is why do you recommend that book? And a lot of times they'll tell you about, Oh, it taught me about this thing. And I'm like, Oh yeah, I already know that thing. I don't really, you know, it's not like the best thing for me to prioritize, but I think like rarely we kind of look at someone we admire and then we say like, Oh, like what book are they recommending? And then I should go read it. But like, we rarely ask the second question, tell me why you like it so much. And that tell me why is often like the, the, the real reason uh, that you should kind of uh, look through it. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Like, I mean, you know that I, I like biographies and I think Cameron, when I started recommending stuff, I think you had, I forget which book it was that you were saying, oh, it's so good. And then I said like, oh, if you like that, then, you know, th these are some some other things. Um, and like two of the books that we talked about was Shoe Dog and Open, which yeah. Shoe Dog, which is uh, Phil Knight, Nike's autobiography, and open Andre Agassi's. But fun fact, I don't know if you, you you knew this. One thing that both of those have in common is they were, and I may be butchering his name, but they were both ghost written by or like written um, with the help of J.R. Mor Moringer. Uh, and so that's that's very interesting, right? Like, so sometimes I'll that. also say like, oh, someone wrote something and it's so good that I'm gonna, like Brad Stone, I think wrote the Everything Store. And then he wrote some other things. So sometimes I'll also follow like who's who's writing uh, this this content too. Hmm. Do podcasts play a role in your reading habit? Hundred uh, percent. So podcasts are super important, especially when uh, there are topics that are not really covered in books all that well. So one thing that you know I'm, I, I've taken an interest to. I mean, I'm not the only one uh, out there, but is just like crypto. Uh, currencies and web three. And I mean, I don't think the best way to learn about that is to go read a book. Um, and so there's a lot of really great podcasts about it. And so it's kind of like outside of my, my, my norm. So what I do for that is I'll, I'll subscribe to some podcasts like industry specific. And so that that's how I consume my content that way. But I try to get different types of content from, uh, you know, from, from, from different books. Uh, from, from like different sources of content. So you have three kids. Can you tell us about how you encourage them to read? Uh, so, so that's a great question. So the kids are pre pre pretty young. Uh, I mean, it, you know, the, the older two are, are twins and, and they're j just about to turn six. So at this point, it's more about, actually, you will get a kick out of this. Uh, so one of my favorite books is, uh, I don't know if you've read it, I actually highly recommend it to parents, although six may be a little too young for this. It's called uh, Why an Economy Grows and How It Crashes. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure it's a Peter Schiff book. But basically, 
uh, wh- you know, who has, you may or may not agree with all of his opinions on all the things, but this book in particular is really good. And I'll tell you why it's, um, it's basically like this cartoon animated book. And it starts off with like three people on an Island. And the, the way it works is like they, they, they go fishing with their hands and every day they can only catch one fish. And, and then they consume that fish and they need one fish to survive. And then this is how things go. One day, one of them has a dream and invents a net. And so all of a sudden he can catch two fish in a day. So he starts to have a savings rate. And so it just goes from like this very basic thing all the way to like quantitative easing and international trade. And it kind of like builds up an economy in that way. And so I, I started reading this to my uh, to my six year olds, and it's you know trying to teach them about economics like very early on, and it turns out it's really hard to teach people about credit and debt and a lot of and like how you should charge more interest if there's going to be more risk and all these things to a six year old. But I'm I'm working hard at it. But I recommend the book. That's one of the ones that I've actually personally read more than once. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it's awesome. I'll have to check that one out. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have for someone who wants to read more? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think the, um, the, the, the main thing is like to capitalize on your emotional state and say like, what book can benefit me the most right now? Uh, what thing that if I learned, I'd be the most interested in? The other thing I would say is like read multiple things or consume multiple things at a time. Again, like I have a roster of things. Uh, usually four to five um, that I have at any point in time. And depending on like what I feel like, I will listen to that. The other thing I found is like for me, from a retention perspective, it's really good for me to alternate between, you know, between books. Because if I, let's say, listen to two hours worth of a book, there might be a lot of things that I would learn. And it's harder for me to digest all of them. But if I only listen to 30 minutes of one and then switch to 30 minutes of another, it allows like this, I don't know, gap that allows me to then like digest the information better and be able to describe like what I've read in, in that thing. The other thing I would say is like, don't, you know, don't re- feel like you need to finish things. Uh, I often don't finish a lot of things. I have multiple things on the go and I don't feel bad if I bought something and I don't finish it. Um, it's, uh, yeah, to me, the other way I look at it is not number of books. Uh, so it, I don't care how many books I consume. Like I, the way I think about it is I'm going to devote, you know, one to two hours a day of content consumption, and I'm going to fill it with the best things that I, that I can. And I don't care where it comes from or how it's done, or if I finish something or not. Uh, it's about like, that's what I'm like optimizing for on, on a per day basis. And I, I, I think if I can do that, uh, I feel pretty good. Amazing. Uh, you, you talked about voice notes and you talked about actioning things that, that come out of those voice notes right away. Do you do anything else for long-term retention? Like do you have a, a, a notebook or anything like that? Um, so I, I, I don't do things for, I, I don't do anything specific. Like occasionally what I've done is like, I I've taken notes, I, I do journal uh, and occasionally I'll put in lessons there uh, but, but the thing I found for me specifically, just like the way I operate, if I learn something and I describe it to someone else, it is like imprinted in my brain and it'll never mm-hmm. go away. If I don't repeat what I've learned to someone else, then it doesn't happen. So one of the things that my wife Amanda and I do is like at the end of the day, amongst our like debrief of the day, uh, I will also say like, here's something I, I learned. And because I've said it, like I will remember that hundred percent. So it's just like the repetition and explaining it to someone else. And as you know, if you, you, you re- really have learned something, if you can explain it to, to someone else. Mm-hmm. That's a great idea. I like that a lot. Super. Aiden, thanks so much for joining us for the reading challenge. So can you stick around for the talking sense part? Yeah, let's do it. So these are the cards from the university of Chicago financial education initiative. Ben and I have kind of put this on ice for a couple months now, we've been. So we'll oh, jump we, back we in. We finished with some all the cards, cards right? Didn't we go through them? I think we all? did, but I, I think I found some that I don't remember us doing, which may speak more <laughs> to my memory than anything. All right, Aiden, you ready? Here's yeah. a question What is something you really want to buy, but you don't need? Uh, can it be something that I did end up buying? <laughs> <laughs> sure. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's very funny. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard of this. There's this thing called an eight sleep mattress. Uh, and it's basically this temperature controlled uh, mattress where you can have a temperature and your partner can have a temperature. And apparently it promotes better sleep. And, you know, for, for a long time, I was like, ah, that's like, you know, just turn up the air conditioner and it'll be fine. Uh, but, I, but I went out and I bought it and, I, you know, I definitely don't need it, but has it actually had a very good impact on, on my life? So I wish I had done it earlier. So maybe buy the things that you don't need. Ben, wow. Wait, so you're really sleeping better with that mattress? Oh, 100%. And the way I know it is I've, I've been really obsessing about sleep is um, I also have an aura ring, which, which, which tracks sleep. So when I saw the numbers in my aura ring improving, that was kind of like more the numeric data about like, yes, this thing actually works. Like it's such a, it's, it's the biggest hack in the world is getting better sleep. And, you know, it used to be, we used to show off about like, oh, I have so little sleep. Look at me, how hard I work. But actually now I show off about getting good, good sleep and a whole bunch of people at fellow, I think there's like seven or eight of us that all have uh, the aura ring and yeah, it, it's awesome. Hmm. Yeah, I, I also obsess about sleep. It's not now I'm interested in the mattress. Um, my answer to the question, Cameron, is uh, is a bike. I don't have a bike right now, and I haven't had one for years. And uh, they're 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 kind of hard for me to get because I'm I'm pretty tall. You can't just go into a store and buy a bike. Um, yeah. So I want one. Haven't bought one yet. So what does that mean? You need a custom bike. That's that's what I mean. Yeah, it's. N not as easy as walking into a store or even ordering from most manufacturers. But that's something you want and you do need. You should get one, especially up there. I don't, do you need a bicycle? I don't think I need a bicycle. What I want is an epoxy resin garage floor finish, but I don't really need that. You must have that, Aiden. Uh, no, actually, I don't. But that's but I have a really friend. Uh, I have a friend that does. They are nice. You can yeah. like slide on them and. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question for you, Aiden. What is the best thing about money and what is the worst thing? Um, yeah, so I honestly, what, what I've come to realize is that like the best spend of money is anything that you can do to uh, save you time or increase your, your time. Like that is like the best use of money that I've realized over the course of time is just like, what can I do to increase the amount of time so that I can, you know, focus on the things that I love doing. That's the best use. Uh, the worst thing about it is like, it, you know, you, you've got like, it, it's a thing to think about and it's a thing to manage. Uh, these are not things. I mean, as you all know, uh, when I first started working with you, it was after I, I sold my last company. And so before that, I didn't have all that much to manage. And so after it becomes a thing that you actually have to actively uh, think about. So I would say like, that's one of, uh, it, is, it is a thing that you, you, you think about and you have to manage, but it can be useful to, to get you more time. Ben? Yeah, I think similar to what Aiden said, the best thing about money is that it, it allows you to move economic value through time, which is a, that, that's a pretty cool thing. The worst thing about it, uh, it's a tough one. I liked Aiden's answer a lot. Uh, one one of the worst things about it is that it's 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 addictive. Like we we know that to be true. It's addictive in the same way that uh, gambling or or drugs are are addictive. The, the the desire to obtain more money and the feeling you get when you do. Uh, so I think that as a generalization is a, a bad thing about money. By the, I mean, I'm sure you've. Had, I, I think I don't know. You probably had the author the. Um... Psychology of money. Yep. Morgan. Oh, yeah, Morgan. It? For sure. Uh, for me, the best thing is it can buy experiences. I think if like the kids talk about a lot of the trips we've done and great things we've done together. Um, and I think your worst things are great. Here's a uh, last question. Name a job that you would never consider doing and why? I'll go first. To me, I couldn't stand being a scientist in a lab. Something about doing something highly technical in a very private indoor environment like that. That's not for me very, it appears to be very introverted. It may not be, but that's my, my observation. Aiden. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a, that's a really tough one. Um, 
but I would say, I don't know. I'm very oriented around, um, where like doing things where I have full control over my destiny. Like I feel like having control over my destiny is like the most important thing for me, the thing that I value uh, the most. And so it often leads me into entrepreneurial endeavors where, uh, you know, and, and that's just there. But yeah, anything where like if I had to be, if you put me in a box and you said you have to operate in this specific way and do these specific things and you can't do anything any other way, like, yeah. And if anything that would have a lot of rules, I, I just tend to, uh, I would not operate well in that. So that, that applies to many a jobs out there, but would not work for me. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not good at being told what to do either. <laughs> uh, a job that I would never want to do is uh, probably s selling something that I don't believe in. Hmm. I've done that before and it's miserable. <laughs> what did you sell? commission mutual funds and oh, okay. insurance my my first ever job that hey. that eventually led me to you <laughs> yeah i didn't know if your title was something before that no that was it okay awesome well this has been fun aiden great to have you on yeah thanks for, thanks for having me always uh fun chatting you know i love the show and thanks for all the work you do awesome well thank you and thanks everybody for listening this week mm -hmm.